people need to do a better job talking about the actual product rather than like, oh, I'm decentralized. Nobody cares. Getting people to change from systems that they use in their day to day isn't going to be with this rally cry of like the ethos of things. Like, oh, be your own bank or like be free. That's more of a war cry for the people that are already in the space, but it's not really the message they push to the masses. People just want to know, how does your product make things better for me? Welcome back to the Next Billion podcast. I'm here in the big chair in a hotel room. Hopefully the crappy webcam will be fixed again pretty soon, but but I'm excited to be joined by Caitlin from uh, Hero Network. Kate, it's uh, great to, to get on a call again. Yeah, great to see you again. Great to finally meet you in person. I feel like I've known you on Twitter for a long time now. <laughs> well, yeah, like uh, I try and uh, convey all of my thoughts that I have onto Twitter. So one day they'll be able to recreate me as some sentient being just based on my tweets, but, uh, <laughs> but that'll be awesome. So so Caitlin, uh, welcome. And uh, we met recently at Breakpoint. Tell us all about that. What's the, it's been a few weeks now. I think everyone's had time to digest. It was kind of a, a maniac kind of week. That's why we were delayed of getting any more content out for a while there. Uh, so sort of tell us, what's been your take on post breakpoint, anything, any learnings there for people at home? Well, I think the first part of it is that it was the first breakpoint, I think so far that they've ever had that has not resulted in knock on wood, something like big industry news that's just like shaking everything up like immediately after or during the conference, which is good. I remember coming back from Lisbon last year and being home for maybe 24 hours before FTX collapsed. Uh, And I know some people were on the flight home when that happened without internet. So definitely much more positive this year, uh, which is really, really nice. And a lot of follow-ups, a lot of, you know, trying to work out different partnerships with other projects in the ecosystem. Uh, All positive though, which is great. And always nice seeing people face-to-face. I know we hadn't met in person before, but it felt like we had. So good to see the step team in person too. Yeah, exactly right. I think that's kind of the biggest value for a lot of these things is I think you just get more stuff done when you can talk to people face-to-face and like put names to faces, actually talk about stuff with literally everyone else in the room. Like before the the conference started, there was a thing on validators. And that was actually like one of my favorite parts of that whole conference was everyone in the room at the same time of all of the validator community. It's so much better than a discord. So yeah, I was pretty happy with that. But uh, probably not a fan of the weather though in Amsterdam at the time, but it's all good. Um, So look, today we're going to be talking about all the cool stuff happening with Hero. So I think last time I spoke to Gunny, there was a lot going on. There was like potential new projects launching, all sorts of exciting things. Some of them have already launched. I think I've been tweeting out some of the the new launches, but tell us what's the latest from Hero and, and what's going on on your side? Sure. Yeah. So it's been a long time coming with everything going on in Hero Network right now. I think Gunny tweeted this yesterday, but team's been building for two years, <laughs> building out all of the derivatives trading and betting infrastructure for different teams to come build on Solana and do that a lot faster and a lot easier. And we're finally getting to the point where the vision of it is coming into real life, which is building out this entire ecosystem of different dApps, shared liquidity, all kind of bringing different approaches to derivatives trading, to betting, gamifying things a bit, and a lot of different projects right now that are either coming live soon or launching tokens, thinking about token economics and what they want to bring to the Solana community with, from that front. So, Well, on that front as well, I, I think Hero put out like a really good explainer. You guys have been doing really good, whether it's like images or I think maybe even videos or something like that, about all of the tokenomics behind the Hero ecosystem, right? Where like percentage of fees of all of the stuff which is happening, like goes back to stakers and stuff like that. But Has that been a focus for you guys is focusing on the tokenomics, I guess, not just for Hero, but also like a lot of these other projects? Definitely. I think a lot of the talks with the projects building on Hero is, you know, they're clearly separate developer teams and whatnot, and they can kind of choose the path that they want to go on for better or for worse. But building on Hero, there's definitely a lot of conversation around thoughtful tokenomics, thoughtful incentives uh, and whatnot, because we sort of have, to your point on the graphics that we've been putting out, this idea of incentives squared, I guess, is what we've been calling it. So Hero is a full value accrual ecosystem. What does that mean? 
Hero basically collects fees from any DAP that builds on top of it, from all of the volume that takes place, almost like a toll booth, if you will. Uh, and 100% of the fees collected go back to ecosystem participants. So 50% of those going to Hero stakers. The longer that you stake your Hero, you can stake it up to three years. You get a sort of multiplier where you receive a higher amount of those fees that are going back to stakers. 25% going to liquidity providers through Radium protocol for the Hero USDC pool. And then the other 25% going to protocol-owned liquidity, to the treasury, basically all of the like critical functions for the network to keep it running. But 100% of any of the fees brought in are distributed back to the ecosystem, rewarding participants for being involved, which I think is super important when you're trying to build out a product that's sustainable and really aligning incentives for the long term. So that is at the Hero Network level. And then when you're building a dApp on Hero, one of the things that builders kind of have as an advantage is not only do they have Hero's liquidity to build on, not only do they have the infrastructure underneath their dApp that they don't need to build from scratch, Hero has volume incentives programs where if you trade on any Hero-powered dApp, you are earning Hero for even doing volume. doesn't matter how much. You don't need to pass a certain threshold. You are literally trading to earn, I guess, as I like to call it sometimes. And there's also uh, staking incentives. So if you stake Hero on the network and you pass like a certain amount of Hero that you staked, you earn discounts on Hero network level fees. So you're paying less for the transactions that you're doing on any dApps that are built. So a lot of different flywheels that are built in, but it doesn't stop there. So any team that's building on Hero's liquidity has access to those incentives for their users, and then they can build incentives themselves at the dApp level. So not only are you as a user, say if you're trading on Pepperdex, which is a DEX interface that's going live shortly in the next month or so, I believe, they have really rich incentives built into their platform. If you're trading on Pepperdex, you not only earn the incentives that Pepperdex had put into place, you're still trading on Hero too. So you're earning incentives at the network level. And it just sort of goes around and around and the flywheels begin to turn and really, really incentives rich where users are kind of earning in a variety of ways in addition to what they're trading. So that was... One of the key points which stuck out to me with Hero is like everyone shares the same liquidity as well, right? So not only there's the flywheel effect that you said, but the more people that trade, the more incentives are dished out, but also the liquidity is shared between everyone. So if one dApp does really well and attracts a billion dollars tomorrow, then all those other dApps also have access to like a billion dollars of liquidity as well. That concept is amazing. I don't really think anyone has done that before, at least in the DeFi world. I think uh, some centralized exchanges have done like shared order books between different pairs and stuff like that. I remember back in the day, some exchanges in, in Hong Kong did that for, for Bitcoin. But like, I think that as a concept is um, pretty unique. I, I'm not aware of anywhere else that's doing that. I think it's important though, because you have so many people building so many different things. That's one of the premises of crypto, right? And DeFi, any team can come on chain and build, which is great. But in terms of like user base and liquidity, it's really hard for all of the dApps that are building to get liquidity to get users. And it's sort of a chicken and egg problem where if you don't have liquidity, you won't get users because users want to trade somewhere with liquidity and trade confidently knowing that they have that. And then you can't really, you know, if you're trying to bootstrap liquidity, that's really difficult to do. And that usually involves like trying to get the funds together yourself initially, trying to get that up and running. And I, I obviously haven't built this myself, but I would assume that's very stressful and there's only so much capital to go around. So it really is a big advantage that any team can come to build on Hero, plug in and have liquidity from day one. They don't need to worry about it. It's already there. And one of the ways that everyone is going crazy about right now in Solana is airdrop season, right? And this is one of the acquisition tools for both liquidity and users that, I mean, Pith recently did an airdrop that's quite successful, I would say. Jupiter, everyone's waiting for that one. I don't know when it's going to come out. I haven't really looked into it, but there's a lot of different ones. I think Gito also announced today that there's airdrops. But what's your take on airdrops in general, right? Like, is it a sign of the bull market returning, everyone getting hyped for something, bringing liquidity back to Solana? What's your take? It's definitely a bull market phenomenon, I think. So that that's well, literally like these things don't work in bear markets, right? You do a, an airdrop and everyone's like, don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. It's probably worth three dollars. Excited about it. Yeah. So that 
I think the sentiment's largely positive on that to see more and more happening. So fingers crossed that that's accurate. Airdrops are interesting. I think that it definitely gets a lot of attention on the front end. It gets a lot of buzz on social media. Very easy to misconstrue social media activity for actual users, actual volume, and actual interest on chain. So I think it's a really powerful way to market whatever you're building because it definitely gets a lot of people's attention. Once people, you know, say you receive an airdrop, I'd be more incentivized to learn about a project if I got an airdrop from them, right? There's a financial incentive almost to dive in a little bit deeper. And without that, there are so many projects out there that unless you have, you know, a personal interest in what they're building specifically, it's kind of hard to dig into everything. So I think in terms of distribution and visibility, it's really good. The thing that we were talking about a little bit offline before this that I think is something that projects need to find a way to unlock is once you have that attention, once you've airdropped to a massive community of potential users, how do you incentivize them to dive in further, right? You get their attention for a minute, but it's a drop in the bucket. And attention is really difficult to keep in this space. Probably another 10 airdrops lined up after that. um, And people are just going to keep farming them if they keep seeing them. So how do you get them to come back? How do you get them to buy in and get them to drink the Kool-Aid? Because that's the part that's actually important. It's great to get distribution to a higher number of token holders. Like for Hero specifically, I always think about, we talk about trying to decentralize and disintermediate the network as much as possible, which means getting the token in as many hands as possible for governance. But you want them to buy in further than just owning the tokens and just holding it. Because realistically, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to do anything more than that. And they could sell too, right? So how do you get them to have a positive experience with what you've actually built beyond a token, I think is something really important. And I'm curious about the mechanisms for a lot of these things, right? I've, I've spoken before about vampire airdrops. I think that's really cool in terms of a concept where you take like an existing user base, like a lot of people, Uniswap was really big, had millions of users. So everyone was like, oh, anyone who has ever used Uniswap, we're going to drop a token on you. And then everyone's like, oh, that's me because I'm everyone. And then everyone gets super happy and you get literally to your DAP, you get everyone who uses like insert big project Mm -hmm. because it's free money for them. They go to your app and then, okay, maybe 10% are retained. But if you get a million people going to your DAP and then you retain 10%, okay, well, that's pretty good. It's worth thinking about it though, in terms of, like you say, are they just getting the airdrop and then sell it and then never use the project again? Is there a way to educate people? Sometimes people like lock up the airdrop or they're like, oh, you need to, I don't know, come back every day for the next 30 days, stand on one foot, turn around three times and and then maybe you'll get it. But yeah, I don't know. What's your take on like the mechanics behind some of these things, whether it's like a vampire drop or like limiting people, like lock it in a vault or something like that. Do you think there's like a good mechanism which you which you think is awesome or it was still experimenting? I mean, definitely a lot of experimenting, but I I really like the idea of the sort of vampire airdrop, as you called it. I don't know why I hadn't heard it be called that before because it makes a lot of sense. And it it also gives a project the ability to sort of tailor who they are dropping the token to, which is great, right? If you're like a lending and borrowing platform or you're a trading platform or whatever it is that you're doing, you can kind of curate the communities that you're getting in front of, which I think is more important than distribution as a whole. It's more of like targeted distribution. So even like as an example, I guess, if you were a derivatives trading network like Hero and you wanted to airdrop to an NFT community, well, maybe maybe that's great. It's good for visibility, good for distribution if it's a strong community. But are you getting it in front of the people who are most likely to use the platform? So yeah. I think that there's a... It's if you want to drop on, on people that have no idea what they're doing, then maybe an NFT community is, is a great spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just takes a lot more explaining. And I think there's, to your point on the education part, I don't see anything wrong with doing it in that way and getting it in front of potential new users as long as you're making the effort after you do that to handhold mm. them. Because that's a lot of what I think is lacking in DeFi sometimes in general. Like we get very hyped up and excited about the few users that are here. But in terms of trying to get new ones, it's going to take a lot more handholding and explaining than most people think are needed. And you're going to be better off for it if you have resources that are available to people. So if you are doing an airdrop like that, that's something you should think about and have ready and think about what would make the most sense of like, you know, you start at step one, step two, step three of how you walk people through things in like the most beneficial way. And do you think this 
revitalization in the Solana price, I guess, or just interest in general, whether that's social media or, or anything, do you think that's driven by these airdrops or is it like a chicken and the egg sort of situation where people don't care about Solana until there's airdrops or is it Solana goes up and then everyone starts airdropping? Like, I don't know, what, what's your sort of thoughts there on, because I think Solana price was going up before Breakpoint, and that was before a lot of these airdrops actually went live, I think. But maybe there was talk of it coming, and maybe that precipitated the rise. What comes first, the the airdrop or the number go up? I think number go up first as a way to get people looking, but then the airdrop was the way to keep them looking and the way to get them a little more excited. Because realistically, if Solana's price was down only, to your point of doing an airdrop in, say, the middle of a bear market, no one's going to care, right? Because at least in my head, I'd write those down to zero until they're not a zero anymore. Like, what's the catalyst that's going to show it, you know, even remotely going up in price after I receive it? So I think price going up first is probably sort of the start of what gets people excited. And that's sort of the way that a lot of people think about it. If I had to guess, it's pretty simplistic of, oh, price is going up in Solana. Good coin, good tech. And now I'm going to care about the things that are being built. If there was a chain that, you know, was like, down only, and then all of these projects want to do airdrops. I don't really think it would garner the interest um, that we're seeing with a lot of the Solana ones that are happening right now. And one of the things I was speaking, I don't know if we were speaking about this, but how a lot of these projects where we talk about bull or bear markets and, oh, nobody cares in a bear market or, oh, it's a bull market, everyone cares. Having your products tied to a specific market and the outcome of, of this like general market it kind of sucks, right? Like if I sell shoes, right, I can probably sell 10 shoes to someone regardless of, you know, if the stock of my shoe company has pumped 80% or not, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's down 80%, right? You probably still have the ability to get people interested in your shoe. It's kind of a project, like a product which isn't dependent on the stock price or whatever, right? So are we in a situation in crypto where we're kind of like, we go into a deep freeze for a few years and then all of a sudden everyone emerges and it's a wonderful spring and there's, you know, Bambi walking around a field and everything. Like, what do you think? Is there a way to escape this? Is there a way to build like, I guess you'd call it a sustainable value attraction creation, something like this that is just evergreen? I think it's possible, but I think that when we get to that point at scale is the part where crypto is successful. And I don't think we've seen that um, to the point that we need it to yet. Like even think about building on Solana, right? Solana fades in and out of favor, depending on, you know, price was down only for like a year, right? And then it makes it easier for people who are maybe outside of the ecosystem who are already skeptical to just look at any project that's built there and whether it's accurate or not, right? Like there are a lot of people building good things. Oh, well, it's on Solana and I'm writing Solana to zero. Therefore, all of the tech that's built on top of it also to zero, and I'm not going to care about it. So it's difficult to have the tie, you know, in those situations. But then look at the other side of that. Solana has been pumping and we've seen a lot of optimism and there's a lot more of people posting on Twitter. Oh, what Solana projects are you interested in? I'm looking now. I want to hear your favorites. Right. And then being tied to that ecosystem is positive. So it's sort of a double edged sword. And I think you get that regardless of what chain it is at some point in crypto for the appeal that it's going to get to people who are outside of this little echo chamber right now. And I really think the only way to get out of that is building products that are so obviously superior in like every tangible way to an end user that they don't even care that it's on chain. Like the part that people, in my opinion, I guess people could argue with me here, but I think the part where crypto wins is where people stop caring what chain, they stop caring that it's on chain. They just know that it works and that it's better, faster, cheaper, and like a better experience overall than what they were currently using now. So it's hard to like get to that. But I think to the point of like maybe more chain specific ties, I think that goes back to like building a sustainable business model too, where the entire model of your business is not contingent on price going up into the right and not sustainable if price happens to go down or stagnant for a long period of time. So I think it depends on what your product is as well. Yeah, it's true. And I think also some of these projects, especially like these decentralized ones and so on, they fall into the category of talking about how they're an on-chain thing and they're decentralized and that sort of thing, rather than, hey, my product's actually good, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are people going to come for the, hey, I've you've got 2,000 validators, like, that's what I really want to see. 
as you say, I don't think anyone cares, right? But I think a lot of projects, maybe that's because they're more engineering focused or don't have a marketing team to sort of convey a message correctly to end users or, or something, right? Where I think people probably need to do a better job talking about the actual product rather than like, oh, I'm decentralized. Nobody cares. If we're saying we want a open playing field of, oh, you shouldn't even know it's on crypto. Okay, that means that you're competing against the centralized ones. And they, mm-hmm. they're talking about their centralized app and their, you know, login with email or whatever it is, login with Google. What are you going to do to compete against that without talking about nodes and bits and bytes and so on? Yeah. I mean, it depends who you're talking to, right? Like developers often get caught. And like when I started working more fully in DeFi versus like I was doing like crypto education for TradFi before this with like institutional investors. If you're in front of an audience of developers, they are much more in the weeds on the day to day of the tech. They're probably going to be more likely to feel strongly like philosophically about what DeFi does and what it enables and all of those great things. But really human nature is more selfish than that in a lot of ways and getting people to change from systems that they largely don't have major problems with that they use in their day-to-day. Getting them to change from that isn't going to be with this rally cry of like the ethos of things like, oh, be your own bank or like be free. And like, That's more of a war cry for the people that are already in the space, but it's not really the message that we should be trying to push to the masses, right? Because a lot of people just want to know, how does your product make things better for me? I'm thinking selfishly, I'm not going to take the time to switch over all of these different things that I use day to day unless it's that much better. And you can explain to me why it's better. And if I care about digging into the details of that further, then you have resources for it. But you don't lead with that because you lose people really, really fast. And it's so easy to get caught up in that. And it's a lot more confusing than we think about being in it day to day. And it's very easy to forget that when we're only talking to other people that are in crypto. True. I think crypto people often can live in a bubble a little bit themselves as well. But another point on a completely different track we're coming towards the end of the year now. We're nearly in the final run. Everyone's going to be talking about Christmas. You're going to go to the grocery store, if not already, and they're going to be playing Christmas uh, songs and stuff. But what's your take for next year? Uh, what have we got ahead of us? Maybe what's happening with Hero? What have you guys looking forward to? Yeah, thoughts, 2024, big year? Yes? No? I think so. I'm hoping so. <laughs> the last <laughs> the last year has definitely been a little bleak, but you know, didn't stop people from building everything, um, which is great. I do a lot feel better like- at the end there though. Like yeah. end of this year, it's been all right, but <laughs> certainly the, the first 75%, not so much. Yeah. Tides are turning for sure. I feel like I felt a pretty big shift in sentiment and you know, like people always make jokes about this, but when you have like your parents or your friends from college that aren't in crypto messaging you about things, that's how you know you're back sometimes, at least for a little bit of time. So I've definitely been feeling a lot of that. I'm pretty optimistic. I feel like in terms of momentum for different projects and a lot of the bigger players in the ecosystem sort of, you know, expanding their horizons and where they're getting, you know, different integrations and partnerships and announcements and even just like tip of the hat for more established institutions, especially when you see like reports from all of these massive TradFi firms that most people in crypto had never heard of before this, which is so funny. I think that in itself is enough reason to be positive. And then you dig into like a lot of the leading projects that are coming live or building up new like upgrades and things and whatnot. So it seems like a lot of good things are happening at once. So even that in itself, just kind of from like a higher, like 10,000 foot view has me a lot more bullish on what's coming. Fingers crossed that that's accurate. I think it would take something pretty big to derail the momentum that is starting right now. And fingers crossed, we don't see that. Specific to Hero, like I was saying before, I mean, we're getting to a point and it was actually happening when the market was like probably at its bottom of having a lot of teams that have been building and those teams starting to go live. And, you know, it's it's difficult, right? Like you can't say when the market's going to turn. You can know when your product is ready and you can know when you're going to put it out. And at what point do you decide, like, I'm going to put this into the world and get feedback and iterate versus looking at price and saying, oh, if it goes like a little further, then maybe we launch and trying to time it. Like no one knows what's going to happen. So we've had... I want to say maybe just under like 25 different teams, dApps, games being built on Hero between derivatives trading and betting, which is largely in, which is interesting, the like traditional iGaming space, 
Uh, you go to these casino conferences and whatnot. They're always looking for new content. It's a pretty archaic model and they all have the same games. So they want exposure to something like crypto because it's definitely like a buzzword. Younger generations are interested in it. It's new. They don't want to build those games themselves. So there's literally a gaming, like an Isle of Man registered or licensed gaming studio building on-chain games to Heroes Paramutual Protocol and selling them or you know working with these different casino operators that have distribution to get games that are on chain to their users. And they don't care that it's on chain, but it's new. Is that online only or is that like in casinos IRL? It's online, but they, so a lot of these are not necessarily like in a casino, you go to to a slot machine and like pull something. A lot of them are more online these days. I think it gets like a wider distribution. And basically what these a lot of these operators have is like a, a website that really is just a library of all these different, you know, gambling and betting games. And then users can come to it and they have this massive list of things that they can choose from to play. So they're sort of aggregating a lot of the different things on the market. So that's been an interesting sort of experiment that we've seen um, of things that are being launched on Hero. The bigger one, of course, at least for projects that have been launching or launching soon, is more on the derivatives trading side. So Flomatic, which is a project more for advanced traders, advanced order types, they're going to have, they recently relaunched their trading API that you can plug in and like kind of write up your command scripts and have it execute trades for you pretty efficiently. They just launched a token recently as well. So that's like one of the first projects in Hero that, again, on that incentive squared of, you know, you have this token of a project built on Hero. They can build in all of these different, you know, incentives and rewards and flywheels. And then next, they are launching specific to Flomatic, a trading terminal, which is just a different spin on a trading UI. Definitely a little bit more for like the advanced trader types than what you'd see on your standard decks. So going to get like a different group of people involved, I think, is sort of the plan there. And then coming soon, I guess soon, TM, as things always are, uh, another project talking more on like building in good incentive systems and tokenomics. Uh, there's a project called Pepperdex that's launching soon. And their idea is to create really this all-in-one, very clean, very simple to use derivatives trading platform, more in line with what you'd see in terms of UI, UX of like a sex very more like new user friendly, but they also are planning to launch a token that has really interesting, similar to Hero, value accrual and rewards and incentives. So that's coming before end of year. And then other than that, I mean, we've had a couple of different teams come to us organically, which is what we love to see. You don't want to have to do biz dev on your platform at some point and like hope that the word spreads and that people can use what you've built without even coming to you. That's the end state of what we want to do. Uh, So guacamole is another platform. Um, oh, that's, yeah. yeah, it's this is like a bold one. And there's definitely some good platforms coming out soon. But Guacamole is probably the biggest sleeper in terms of a meme coin turned to actual product, taking like the momentum that they got from the meme coin itself and actually turning it into something. It's one of the best UIs I have seen in crypto. It is, they, have, they have a lot of stuff going on. Like I have no exposure to Guac or anything like that don't know much about the project, but I went on the page once to see all the different stuff's going on. And usually with a meme coin project, you expect like, okay, there's going to be some pictures of dogs or like some guac, something like that. And then that's it. Right. But yeah, they actually went down the path of making a lot of financial products from it, which is pretty crazy. You don't really see that from a meme coin. Usually it's it's about the, the GIF images, right? But yeah, yeah it's, I, it's interesting to see, right? Because like you see all these meme coins, but how do you turn it into something like sustainable that people can go use, which is really cool. So Guacamole, they're calling it like Solana Super App. And they have a lot of like, whether it's games or, you know, they have like a full trading platform. I think they launched Borrow Lend as well. Staking, I think too. Like literally everything you could think of, they're trying to put on there. And they're doing it in such a thoughtful way of like, even the widgets on every screen that you go to, it's like, oh, well, it's that color because of XYZ. Or like they take the ingredients of guacamole and each one of those is a separate section on their site. So just little things like that. The guy running product um, or the contributor that's doing a lot of that, um, I've spoken with him and just like so, so thoughtful. It's like a blueprint for other projects that they should be looking at. They came to Hero independently. Like we didn't even speak to them. They were like, we could just tell that Hero's liquidity and infrastructure was built by people who clearly worked in trading. And we wanted to build on that rather than building it ourselves. So we power their uh, perps and expiring futures. That's awesome, man. And it's cool to see, there's actually a few meme coins that are doing more than just being a meme on Solana as well. Like 
So shout out to the Samo Famo as well. Samo have a lot of like technical analysis stuff. I think they do weekly calls and a lot of that different stuff on all sorts of different tokens, uh, but they have a good community there. So they built that and during the bear market, they were persevering, which is great. Bonk, whatever people think about Bonk, actually Bonk, they have been like supporting and funding a lot of the initiatives through the last say 12 months, whether it's hacker houses or like sponsoring different things and, and so on. So yeah, it's a meme, but also they've been putting their money where their mouth is as well in, in some respects. So that's really cool. I think Solana has quite a few of those examples where it's just like total memes, but it turns out that they're run by really legit people that know what they're doing and they try and make it more than just a meme, right? Yeah. Which, hey, that, that's great. It's a good place to start, right? If you're like trying to find a way to capture attention in an audience, like it's cool to see people doing more with it. To your point on Bonk, I guess I should mention this as well. We were talking about airdrops. Hero recently announced that the network's going to be doing an airdrop to all Bonk holders of 10 million Bonk or more, which, you know, when you look at the price, it's like a lot of people are Bonk millionaires. So yeah. um, <laughs> that's definitely like more of a testament to we consider Bonk to be kind of the social layer of Solana at this point, right? Like in the last year, they could not have emerged at a better time. The token could not have like done it in a better way to like unite the community at a time when it was needed. And to your point, they have been on it ever since then. They never stopped. They have been involved in so many different projects in the ecosystem. And they're really using like, I think Bonk Treasury really to try to like stimulate different projects and fund new things. Like they're doing more in terms of like biz dev and shipping product than most teams on Solana, I would say, yeah. with the number of like integrations, partnerships, launches that they've facilitated. It's great. So Hero obviously wants to like align with that, hence the airdrop, but they have a massive community and people are crazy about it. So they're definitely doing a lot of the right things in terms of taking a meme coin and doing more. Yeah. I mean, this all gets back to our initial sort of comments on airdrops in general. It's a way to get people in, but you've got to have ways to get the people to stay as well, right? So you've got to have useful products that people care about and yeah, actually go and, and think about how you build them as well. It's not just here's a billion coins, see you later tomorrow. Oh, everyone dumps it. Oh, okay. I guess that was fun. Next one. Ideally, you know, we want to see more projects that are building useful things and uh, yeah, being able to utilize other parts of the ecosystem as well, whether it's partnerships with other projects, maybe it's building on hero, shared liquidity, all that sort of stuff. Where should people go to find out more, whether it's blogs, Twitter, videos, anything like that, feel free to, to shill. Uh, we'll put some links below, but uh, where should people go to find out more about Hero? The main place to go would be first following on Twitter, just at Hero Network, uh, Hero spelled H-X-R-O. <laughs> For those who don't know how to say it, we get that a lot. And then Hero.com is the main website. If you're a developer, there's links there to Docs. If you're interested in staking or already have staked, there's a link to Hero.Finance, which is like the staking and governance community program portal. And then also in the Discord. So if you have questions about the network, whether you're more retail facing, questions about dApps that are being built, if you're a dev that wants to build on Hero, that's the easiest way to talk to uh, core contributing devs and get your questions answered, get things up and running. So if you're very interested in diving into more of the nerdy side of the protocols and the risk engine and all of those things, we have that documented. I know you told me when I saw you that you had been diving into it recently as well, which we love to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did exactly that. And follow uh, Dead Kate Bounce as well, right? On Twitter. Yeah. That's your handle. Awesome. Check it out. We'll put some links below, but thanks so much for your time uh, today, Kate. It's always a pleasure. And yeah, go and check out some of these products. It's airdrop season, right? So it's a good example of when people should be out there using products. And hey, maybe your wallet gets included in some airdrop sometime in future by whatever other projects out there. But the general thesis is just start using Solana projects and uh, it'll turn out well. But uh, thanks so much for your time today, Kate. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Great. Thank you. Cheers. 